Uh, welcome to the annual uh, Indu Bhatt lecture. Uh, this is a lecture endowed by the Bhatt family. And before I introduce uh, Nachiket Bhatt, I want to tell you a little bit about the role that the family has played in establishing South Asian studies at Yale. Um, Dr. Praveen Bhatt um, and Indu Ben um, uh, came to Yale uh, in uh, the 19, late 1960s. Um, they uh, were from Gujarat and uh, were closely associated with the Gandhian movement. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi himself congratulated uh, Praveen Bhai and Indu, Indu Ben on their wedding. Uh, Dr. Bhatt first came to the US to pursue postgraduate studies at Tulane uh, and returned to Yale uh, in the Department of Comparative Medicine in 1968. Um, after his retirement, he turned his attention to promoting the study of India and South Asia at Yale. Uh, he himself was one of our first Hindi language instructors, and he served as secretary to the South Asian Studies Committee, which was its earliest form of the council, and uh, was an advocate and a supporter for the South Asian Studies Council um, through the 1990s. Um, and uh, the, the family supports two annual lectures, which has brought in people from South Asia to address both questions of, of research and of contemporary importance, as well as supporting a range of travel fellowships for students to go to South Asia and work. Uh, we feel Dr. Bhatt's absence very keenly this year. This is the first year uh, he passed away uh, last year, and this is the first year he's not with us for the lecture. Uh, but we're very grateful to have uh, Nachiket here to sort of address a few words. So. Thank you for that. Welcome, everybody. It's so nice to see everyone here. Um, it's just a little bit odd because usually it's my dad. So um, I just want to say a couple of things. This is something that was a labor of love. So when we saw, talk about uh, what is being a Gandhian, my parents grew up in the Free India Movement. My dad was born in 23, my mom in 27. They married in 46. They, married, they were engaged in a prison because my grandfather, on my father's side, was a writer um, as well as an educationist and he started uh, agrarian schools uh, in, in, in Gujarat. Um, to look at a number of different ways of, of raising um, the educational attainment of rural vi villagers. So with that, being a writer and writing against uh, occupation, he was jailed a few times. And my maternal, grandma, my maternal grandfather was dying. They were betrothed to be married, and yet both grandfathers wanted um, my mother to finish her studies. She was getting a degree in economics and she did. Uh, she completed that before she was moving in, and the idea was, was that for them, that they were a part of this movement, and they espoused it in their lives. They lived here in the States in a very simple, austere way, yet they put forth things that mattered to them. After medicine, my dad retired. He was retired. He didn't need to do anything further, but he felt a need for South Asia, and so did my mom. They both enjoyed students regularly at their home. Um, my mom shared so many things about that. And for her, women's rights, children's rights, were that important. And so today is more, more than fitting to honor them and to, to be here uh, to listen to Dr. Banerjee talk about some most important work. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Good. It's uh, also my privilege to introduce our uh, speaker for today, Dr. Rukmini Banerjee. Uh, Rukmini, if I could invite you to come to the front. Uh, so uh, Dr. Banerjee is uh, currently the CEO of Pratham, uh, which is uh, one of is India's largest uh, nonprofit research group uh, doing both research and advocacy in the field of education. Um, Dr. Banerjee trained as an economist, uh, was educated at St. Stephen's College uh, at Delhi School of Economics, was a Rhodes Scholar to Oxford, and finished a PhD at the University of Chicago. Uh, she began a career as a program officer in the Spencer Foundation, set up by Lyle Spencer, which sort of seeks to do public policy work in the field of education, and moved to India in 1996 to work with Pratham as part of the leadership team. Um, Pratham was set up as an NGO initially to provide education to children in the slums in Bombay, but it grew collaborating with governments, communities, uh, and importantly, parents and teachers uh, to make interventions to address gaps in the education system. Um, and to sort of think of how public education has changed in India, the focus in the late 90s, early 2000s was really on enrollment in schools. 
Uh, but despite enrollment figures going up quite dramatically in the early 2000s, one of the things that Pratham and the Asar report that uh, Rukmini was instrumental in, in doing was to show that um, increase in enrollment didn't necessarily lead to increase in learning outcomes. And uh, the sort of key intervention that Pratham made was really to focus on both measuring and improving learning outcomes in schools. Uh, prior to becoming uh, the CEO, Rukmini led uh, Asar's sort of research, uh, Pratham's research division um, and uh, was instrumental in creating the annual status of education reports, uh, which uh, did a kind of subcontinental assessment of uh, learning, uh, sort of reviewing over 600,000 children each year. Uh, through its scale, annual persistence, and sort of bottom-up approach, Asar sort of changed the fundamental debate over questions of learning in India. Um, today, Pratham has operations in 21 of India's 29 states, reaches millions of children and young people uh, from Kashmir to Tamil Nadu, uh, and their methods of assessing uh, learning outcomes have been uh, uh, you know, exported across India's borders and have inspired uh, parallel citizen-led initiatives uh, to focus on learning outcomes in schools. Um, one of the most delightful things of sort of writing this up is to discover Rukmini has another career as a writer of children's books. Uh, in, in Hindi and English, uh, which are uh, a part of Pratham's pedagogic uh, initiative. So welcome to Yale, and we very much look forward to the lecture. I, I'm um, used to speaking to school children, so I have to stand up. <laughs> I, I hope that's OK. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, uh, what uh, Rohit didn't say is that uh, I have connections to several of his family members, uh, which I only discovered uh, after he wrote to me to come here. Uh, his, uh, one of the first studies that I did, uh, in, my, in the first year I did alone, and the second year I had some people, and one of the key people was his mom. Uh, when we started the Asar effort in 2005, in the first year, his brother was a key part of it. And so these are, these are just stories I've put together once uh, he wrote to me. And I think you mentioned who you were. So then I could make the, make the connections. Uh, it's, it's really an honor to be here. Um, I think it's a really an honor to be part of uh, something that your family has started, uh, Mr. Bhatt. I have a small uh, little story on the side that I thought I should say so that I can connect to uh, the, uh, especially to your, to your mom. Um, uh, I'm sure she would have known the connections. Uh, in 1917, I think, uh, Gandhiji went to Bihar. I, I'm from Bihar. And they went, you know, as part of the Champaran movement. And while what uh, um, Gandhiji did became, you know, made the nation's history, perhaps what Kasturba did didn't reach quite the same uh, level of publicity. But the ashram in which they lived is in a place called Bhitiharva, which is in a very, uh, you know, it's, it's even today it's about uh, uh, maybe 50 kilometers from the district headquarters. And another probably 50 kilometers you hit Nepal. So it's really in a very tucked away corner of uh, Bihar. And uh, for the centenary of the Champaran uh, uh, movement, you know, a lot of different things were done in Bihar. And as is traditional, if you actually go to the ashram and you talk to people there, they say people come twice a year, once for Gandhiji's birthday and one for his death anniversary. And the rest of the time, the ashram is, you know, left to its own devices. And uh, I, I have a, we have a big team in Bihar and they felt that they need to do something to honor the, uh, you know, not so much what happened with the indigo planters, but because the whole country will honor that but to do something about the fact that Kasturba lived in that ashram and uh, tried to do a lot in the local community uh, for education, for health, for sanitation and so on. And there's a big scheme in India now called the Kasturba Gandhi Balika Vidyale, which is a Kasturba Gandhi and Balika is girls and Vidyale is schools, which are residential schools which have been set up by the government in very backward blocks to help girls who for one reason or the other, either have left school or at risk of leaving school. And there is actually in that location a Kasturba Balika Vidyale. And so two things happened. Um, one was that um, uh, uh, some of my young colleagues in Pratham felt that they had to do something that, you know, um, uh, that would be in the tradition of 
of uh, a true tradition of Gandhi. Gandhi ji is used in many ways in India today uh, by many kinds of people, and I think he's truly a public good, so people should be free to use him. Uh, but we wanted to do something that was perhaps truer than, uh, than what is normally done. And so 12 of my colleagues actually walked from Patna to uh, Bhiti Harva, uh, which is a distance of, uh, I don't know, two, 300 kilometers perhaps. And they took about 18 days and they stopped every night in a, in a village. And they carried with themselves only, like I think, one change of clothes and a mosquito net. Uh, the mosquito net was my idea because uh, <laughs> I think the, <laughs> No, I don't know how Gandhiji dealt with mosquitoes, but, uh, but uh, I think you need to sleep in a mosquito net. And along the way, people took care of them. And they talked a lot. This was in the month of April, so you really had to leave very early in the morning. And so you spent the rest of the day in the village. And uh, they you know, uh, had many adventures and learned many things. And um, you know, uh, we decided after that that we need to do not just a walk, which, you know, of course, was a very important thing to do. But we are now working in Bhiti Harva, uh, in the Balika Vidyale, but also in about a cluster of 20 schools around. And uh, that has been quite an adventure, uh, and we hope to be there for at least the next three to five years. Uh, Gandhiji himself was there for about a year and more, but we think change takes a long time. So I'm sure your uh, uh, mother must have known this story, because when they were there, it seems that they could not mobilize a lot of the local people to do some of this work. I mean, there was a lot of involvement in the, uh, you know, the work that was happening with the indigo planters. But on the basic education and basic health, not very many people joined them. And they sent out a message to their friends. And many of their friends came from Gujarat and elsewhere to live with them there. And they lived in the ashram. So, uh, perhaps I will keep you informed of what happens there. So anyway, this was an aside. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, I think my is there a clicker? I'm mindful of the instructions I've been given by the gentleman at the back, so I'm not moving too much. Yeah. Okay. What what I thought I would do today, and I know we want to leave uh, enough time for actually a conversation. Uh, last night I went out for dinner with uh, let's see. Some of the people I went out for dinner are perhaps in this room. And uh, they asked me many questions. And so I would, thought that would be a good idea to, I'll say, I'll talk for a little bit, but then maybe open it up. Um, my story starts, let's see, how does this work? Down, down. Yes. Okay. So my story starts, um, this is a school. Uh, it's a, this is just an ordinary school in Bihar. I had a phone call some years ago, and uh, the voice sounded young. Um, the person introduced themselves as a district magistrate of this district in Bihar called Jahanabad. And for those of you, you know, I'm sure everybody here knows who a district magistrate is. He's sort of the head of the district administration. It's usually a post that young bureaucrats get after a year or two in service, so they're still quite, quite young. And he called me and he said, uh, you know, uh, I have a problem. And somebody gave me your number and perhaps you can help to advise me. Uh, I said, what is the problem? He said, you know, we are a small district. The district has about uh, 800 schools or so. So it's a relatively small district for India. And he said that I have, um, I've tried everything. Uh, you know, the attendance in my school is quite low. Uh, am I doing okay? Yeah. Uh, the attendance in my school in my schools is quite low. It was a time at which, uh, you know, the Bihar government had done quite a lot of work in, you know, bringing children to school, and they were beginning to monitor how schools are functioning. And he said that, you know, I've tried everything I know how to do, so I've made sure that most teachers are in school because that's a common complaint that people have: the teachers don't go to school. Uh, I have made sure that all our textbooks are distributed in time our scholarships and all the other entitlements that the government has, they're all going. Um, I have a, you know, the structure in the district is, uh, under the district there are uh, blocks, which are about 100 or 150 schools, uh, and there are people at the block level, and then there is a cluster, which is about 15 or 20 schools. So there are officials at each level, and he said, I've made sure that they move around. And 
having done all of this, which I feel is in my hands to do as a bureaucrat, I was hoping that the you know uh, attendance would go up, um, but it's still really at 70%, and we seem to be unable to make it go higher. Now, this was a time at which the Bihar government was reviewing attendance in districts quite regularly. And uh, Jahanabad was one of the highest attendance districts. And yet it was still at, whatever, 60, 70%. So he said, I really don't know what else to do. But having, you know, uh, maybe 30% or more of kids not in school on a regular basis is not a good thing if we think schooling is important. And, you know, I was very impressed by the way he stated the problem because he had sort of worked his way through what he could do. And at the point that he was, he was sort of saying that now I don't know what else to do. Um, if I just stop there and take a step backwards, um, and, you know, uh, I'm sure some of you are historians here. And uh, I have some historians who are, who are my close friends who always say you can't talk about the present without... Uh, you know, going back. I thought that was what older people did, but, but apparently that's a historical principle. So, uh, you know, and the same friend uh, said to me that it all starts with the fact that Nehru made a big mistake. And Nehru's biggest mistake is uh, that he didn't give enough importance to primary education. So I leave this as a question to the historians and others in this crowd about what Nehru did right or wrong. But I would say that over the last 30 years or more, Perhaps whatever we didn't do straight after independence has been done. And, uh, you know, we are not that different from many other countries who believe that, you know, every child should be in school and therefore may have made, you know, the government, parents, everybody, I think there's consensus, which has only grown in the last at least 25 years, that every child should be in school. And today in India, we are at a condition where I mean, not today. I think this has been the case for almost 10 or more years that more than 95% children are actually enrolled in school. There is still, as we were talking earlier, a last 5% which may be difficult and may have issues. But by and large, we have schools everywhere. We have schools within one kilometer of children's homes in you know, most places. And to give you an idea that it's not just that we have high enrollment, if you go back and even 10 years ago and look at how many children were reaching eighth grade, um, if you look at the census, the last census in India, almost every age group, so how many, how many six-year-olds, seven-year-olds, 10-year-olds are there in India, a rough number is about 25 million in each age group. And so if you look at eighth grade enrollment in 2007 or eight, the number was about 12, 13 million. So of 25 million, 10 years ago, about half had reached eighth grade. And if you look at uh, numbers, more recent numbers, uh, maybe from 2017 or 18, that number is close to 23 million. So in this 10 year period, not only have we ensured that almost everybody is enrolled, but I think it's now the case that almost everybody stays at least till the end of uh, eight years, the end of elementary schooling. And this is, you know, you know, many people can claim credit for it. Many policies can claim credit for it. Uh, you know, we guarantee uh, schooling till eighth grade, and I think we are um, we are almost achieving it. So, from the point of view of my district magistrate, you know, he was also reiterating the fact that he has high enrollment. The problem is that, you know, enrollment is high, but. Um, I remember asking a, 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 chai, a class in, uh, in uh, uh, UP, uh, the word in uh, Hindi for enrollment is a big word, it's called Namankan. And so I asked the children, because on the blackboard in many uh, classrooms they say Namankan and then they say Upasthiti, which is attendance. So I said, what is Namankan? And the kids gave a very good explanation. One of the kids got up and said, Namankan ka matlab hai ki sabka naam school a gaya hai. Everybody's name has come to school. And therefore, this gap between everybody's name coming to school and everybody coming to school, you know, varies in the country, varies day by day, varies uh, on the seasons. And my DM of Jahanabad was worried about the fact that there was, the, you know, this gap. If I look back even at our own history in Pratham, uh, you know, we came across this problem some years ago. 
Uh, our tagline, or I think it's called mission statement, is every child in school and learning well. And we think that every child in school and learning well is important. But even in our first some years, we worked a lot on the every child in school. Because it, even in Bombay, we started in Bombay, even in Bombay they were in say 1996 or 7, there were still some sections of children who were out of school. But as we worked there, uh, you know, we too began to feel this, uh, you know, the visibility of the children out of school is obvious. You know, you can see kids who are out of school. You still see some kids at traffic lights or, you know, playing in the, uh, you know, fields in the village and so on. But the feeling that we had was that the visible problem is there and people are tackling it, but there are some problems which are not as visible. And the invisible problem was of the kind that you are in school, but you're not really, um, as parents would say, that, uh, you know, they're not learning as much as we, I mean, things are not happening as much as we thought. Teachers feel that, you know, I'm working hard, but somehow it's not going as far as we want. And if you look at kids' behavior, I always thinking, think that watching kids is actually the best way to understand what's going on. You see a lot of children in India, especially in government schools, after lunch, who are outside. Um, you know, it, it, it's not like they're working, but they're doing a lot of other things which are perhaps more fun. So in a funny way, you feel this problem, which is the, and the real problem that I see is that teachers are getting discouraged because somehow things are not happening. Parents are getting disappointed because a lot of parents whose children are in school today haven't had much schooling themselves. And so they have very high aspirations from education. And the kids are just disinterested because whatever is happening outside seems to be a little bit more fun. And this perhaps is the problem that both the district magistrate of Jahanabad felt uh, more recently and we felt earlier. So how do you get to the, you know, what is the problem? Clearly one issue that we felt was that you know, it's difficult for the teachers and the children to cope with what ought to happen in the classroom. And the parents can't cope with it because often they are, they don't know quite what to do. And so, you know, if we think that the real problem now is children are in school, but they are not getting what they ought to be getting or the value added, then you need to concretize that a little bit. And even for us working in Pratham, how to make this more concrete, how to make it more visible was important because otherwise you can't tackle a problem unless you really understand it. Um, you know, how do you understand a problem? Different people have different ways of getting at it. And we felt the best way for us to understand the problem was to spend more time with the children and really get at what is, why is this core interaction that education is about, which is the thing that happens between teaching and learning what is the problem right there? And, you know, spending some time thinking harder, questioning even what we were doing at the time. I mean, we, were, we thought we were doing education, and I think we were. But where is it not giving you the value? We came up with a couple of things. Uh, and I, I, I remember I had just gone back from, um, from the, I just have some pictures, because I think otherwise just talking is boring. So, so the, you know, you may notice there's no text. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I remember that I had, I had uh, you know, just gone back from Chicago to Bombay. I knew some Marathi. And so I decided that one way to educate myself was to spend some time in, in the schools. And I started doing some work in math because that didn't require as much language. And one of the things that I realized was, what do you start teaching with? Now, typically, at least in India, perhaps in Yale, I don't know, you start teaching with a curriculum. <laughs> And that curriculum has been designed by presumably people who know what is to be taught. Uh, and then, uh, you know, and that curriculum has attributes like textbooks and exams and things like this. And you, that's the framework that is traditionally used for teaching. And I realized that in Bombay, partly because I couldn't do the Marathi. And secondly, I really wanted to understand, you know, what children could do comfortably so that then you could decide whether you wanted to go ahead or to help the children who were left behind. Uh, I started doing very simple math, but because of all these reasons. And one of the early realizations was that although we were dealing at that time with grades three and four, it almost was that you had to start with preschool stuff. And this is in Bombay, which even 
20 years ago was quite advanced and if you saw the schools in Bombay, infrastructure was quite fine. Everybody was coming to school. Parents had some education and yet kids seemed to be far behind where they were. And so the natural thing that we all do with kids in our own homes is to start from where the kids are and so that you build on what you can do and then go towards you know, what you can't do. And that's essentially what uh, we, we, we did when we uh, kind of took a step back. Um, a couple of other things I think were very noteworthy at the time, that if you start with things that people can't do, then the disinterest comes in much earlier. If you start with things that kids can do and maybe push them just a little bit harder, and if you do things, for example, one of the things that we did and we still continue to do is before, which I should have done with this group as well, but I know we have a time limit, so I didn't, is you need to engage one-on-one -on -one a bit. And perhaps your chai and samosas is a way of doing that, is that you engage a little bit one-on-one, -on -one, so you get a sense. And maybe what uh, Surbi did yesterday was to enable that over dinner, that you have some personal engagement one-on-one -on -one and get a sense of where kids are, so that then you can move up. And the first thing we noticed is, although we love our children in India, just like everybody loves their children everywhere, we tend to deal with them as groups. So at home, you know, there's a bunch of kids, so you have to get up on time, and you have to eat on time, and so on and so forth. The troublesome ones you pay a little bit more attention to, but the average ones are treated. And in school, you're treated as a big group as well. So even though, uh, you know, uh, uh, you spend time with kids, it's often very rare, at least in school, to have spent time one-on-one -on -one with kids. And the one-on-one -on -one with kids actually gives you a lot of insights into where they're at. And therefore, building your activities to take kids ahead is much better grounded, obviously, if you have a good sense of where kids are at. And don't pay as much uh, attention to what they're supposed to be doing. So start where they are and you know, go to where they need to be. Uh, the motivation for kids to want to uh, tell you where they're at comes from when they see that you're actually interested in them. If they think that you, your main purpose is to get the textbook finished, then they behave with you in the same way. So I think we, you know, I think this is, it's common sense, but I think it's also something that uh, often in education in India, people have to be reminded that each kid may be different, pay attention to them. And uh, if your curriculum is good, then it addresses this question. And if not, then maybe you have to think about what to do. And so, you know, one of the things that came out of this exercise was that across the country, in, I mean, we were not as large as we are today, but we were quite large. There were at least two, three hundred people. We decided that we need to figure out what we need to do next if we want to get rid of this uneasy feeling, concretize it, and then look for solutions. So our analysis was that there were two or three fundamental things that kids were still weak on. One was a lot of kids had gone through several years of schooling, but not able to read as yet. And what does not being able to read mean? If I had to have you know, everybody participate in a similar conversation, then they're not, oh, I mean, I'm, I'm you know, fast forwarding a little bit, but it meant that could you, what could you not read? Could you not even read letters? Could you not read simple words? If you could read simple words, then what's the difference between the simple words and a simple sentence? And then finally, why do you read? Because you want to read something. So this is like a story. And so can, could you not read the story? And we found that even simplifying it like this did two things. One is you could actually figure out what the distribution of kids that you had. And the second was you could think about what to do for taking kids from one step to the other. So this whole thing, and what would you want to give kids to read who are just learning to read? So all of this, I think that this, this, uh, this uh, one piece of paper kind of uh, captured a lot of the learnings we had. And I think this was around 2001 or two that we decided as a lot of the leadership team within Pratham, maybe a couple of hundred people, that we should take a month out and see what you can do once you've understood the problem then what do you do? How long does it take for a kid to move from reading letters to reading the story? Why a month? For no good reason other than month is a month and everybody seems to recognize it. Uh, and it also puts some kind of a time frame on it. You know, two months just seems double of that. So how about we try to see what you can do in one month? Uh, and, um, uh, you know, also people ask you, what are you doing? So 
you know, you have something to, you know, you say. So from this came, I think, our, a couple of things. One is, we were able to, while reading maybe a very complicated thing, but to be able to understand it for yourself and to be able to explain to parents, where is your child and all of this was easy to do then. Secondly, you could do this in any language. Uh, and so it didn't need a lot of differences by language. The third is, for everyone, I think it's helpful to have a goal. So where are you headed? I mean, the, you, know, you could be headed to reading the Mahabharat, which you know, I hope all of you have, because you're highly educated people. <laughs> but at least being able to read simple text with some comprehension would be a reasonable goal for reading. So this also helped you see the goal. And I say see the goal seriously because there were a lot of parents who were not literate. So when they said, what are you doing? You could say that the kids should be able to get up to here. And the visible here, you can see. And if you, somebody reads it out to you, then you know kind of what level is it is at. The simple paragraph as well was very important for us. And we didn't realize it at the time. But when you had kids start reading it, we realized that actually reading a sentence is sometimes harder than reading a set of connected sentences. And as you begin to read like the second line, the kids are aware that this is all connected. And so they do what I later learned is called psycholinguistic guessing, mm -hmm. uh, which is to guess ahead what that is. Uh, we are often told that, uh, you know, Pratham does all these things and, uh, you know, um, uh, they don't go into depth and this is just decoding and this is not reading with comprehension. And I think that people who criticize us for that actually haven't sat a lot with kids and watched them read. Because I remember a, a little paragraph like that. Uh, the, the paragraphs are very useful because you feel like you've read something, but it's actually only four lines. So it gives you a sense of accomplishment. And at some point, I'm going to show you a, a, a short video which also highlights that I think that kids build on success. So if you feel you can do this, then you try the next thing. And so it's important to give you stepping stones which make you feel like you're making progress. And I remember coming up with a paragraph, and I'll tell you uh, how many people here understand Hindi. Plenty of people. So I apologize for those who don't. It's quite simple Hindi. So the paragraph was, Sham ko papa ghar aate hain. In the evening, my father comes home. Haad dhokar khana khate hain. He washes his hands and he eats dinner. Ma se baate karte hain. He talks to my mother. Phir so jate hain. And then he goes to sleep. All four, all four lines are quite straightforward. There's no complication in the sp spelling or the grammar. But child after child, I remember, was hesitating on the third line. And I couldn't understand why that should be. Their voice would go down. And finally, after I think the third or fourth kid, I said, what's the matter? And one of the children said, Papa, mummy se baate nahi karte. <laughs> okay. My dad doesn't talk to my mom. So, I mean, I think even listening to their voice, you realize that they were thinking, you know, this is, this is not true. Okay. Uh, so, I think that even listening to things like this actually gave you a sense, not just of what is their ability to read, but what are they thinking? How are they going? Uh, I, I, I have another example that I always remember. Uh, this was in Bombay. And the paragraph said, uh, Mere ghar ke samne ek nala hai. You know, there's a, there's a uh, whatever, drain in front of my house. And almost, I think, three or five kids read this, and everybody replaced the word nala with gutter, which to me is a very high level of not only are you reading, but you're also replacing the word with what ought to be the word there, because that's the word that's in common use. Right. So all of this, I think, close observation of what the kids were doing helped us to come up with, uh, you know, stuff that could really be helpful and, and useful. And as a result of that one month, you know, uh, many things happened. One was that you realized that there could be substantial progress in a short period of time. We didn't start with small children, I have to say that. We started with kids who had already been at least seven or eight because they are cognitively ready to do many things. Uh, they've also been, they've had some exposure to print, whether they can read or not. Uh, and partly also because there is an urgency by the time you're that age to really move fast, because the actual curriculum is a lot further than this. Whereas for the young ones who are just starting school, there is still, still time. So we could see that even in a month, a lot of progress can be made. And a lot of these kind of instructional, you know, I mean, common sense things 
uh, came out of, uh, you know, two, three hundred people doing this with everybody with a bunch of kids actually gives you a lot of information, a lot, I mean, a lot of experience on what needs to be done. So we had a, I would say, a instructional path forward about how do you accelerate this problem because you can now concretize the problem using something like this and we have a similar one for math and also with uh, what you do about it. So that it's not just that you're saying that there's a problem, you also have some kind of a solution that you could propose. But a couple of other things happened that we had not expected. So for example, some of the work that we were doing was not happening inside the school. We did some, in, we did wherever it was convenient, sometimes inside the school, sometimes outside the school. Very interestingly, and we felt this right from the beginning of Pratham, that the outside school space is often not given as much value in education. If for some reason, we think the stuff that happens inside a classroom is really important. And the stuff inside the classroom is often highly structured as, you know, uh, you know, we sit in rows and columns, we do that in primary school, we do it at Yale. There are certain, you know, frameworks that seem to come into place as soon as you're inside the classroom in an educational setting. When you're outside, it's really a big mess. And as a result of the big mess, a lot of people can act of their own accord. And one of the things that happened is people asked us, what are you doing? Now, inside the school, very rarely does anybody ask you what you're doing, because it's very obvious what you're doing, you're teaching. But outside the school, people want to know what are you doing? And I think that that was a very important thing for us because we realized that if you want to carry a lot of people along, then it's important to say what you're doing and have people question you. Uh, uh, you know, uh, there, there, there is a, uh, a particular event that happened to me and I wished at the time that there were no cell phones then, so you could have taken quick videos and then used it in talks forever. But this was a... As we began to work in uh, rural areas, we would do what we called a village report card. The village report card was essentially exactly what I just described, that you need to understand where kids are before suggesting any path you know, for the village. And so basically you went around the village and you started using that simple tool to get people to engage to see could kids read. And you know, do you go to school and can you read and can you do basic math? And after doing it for a little while, actually it's quite straightforward, so a lot of other people begin to help. And there is conversation that begins to happen. You know, there's conversation at the higher level, which is the adults. There's conversation among the kids and so on. And again, that generates a lot of talk around what is the issue, if indeed there is an issue. Um, uh, I, I actually did time it once that in a place like UP or Bihar, it often take, took 45 minutes for the discussion to start and then end at a point where you can actually move forward. And so the discussion starts with the British. I don't know if there are any British people in this room, uh, but please don't take it personally. But it starts with how the British wrecked us. So, okay, that, that happened quite a while back. So then you come down to, you know, Nehru, and then to Indira Gandhi, then to blah, 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 then to the chief minister, then to... So, you know, it, it takes time for the blame to be attributed to everyone. And then finally you come down to, you know, you blame the teachers. If you're a parent, you blame the teachers. If you're a teacher, you blame the parents. And when you have no one else to blame, you blame the children. Because you say, oh, I got the kid ready and he went to, you know, but he's not learning, right? And the only person you don't blame in all of this is, of course, yourself, because everybody else is to blame. So you go down that whole route. And, you know, once you reach the point that, you know, everybody accepts that, yes, people are going to school, but they're having difficulty learning, then you have many choices. One choice is do nothing. I mean, you're not compelled to act, you can just let things be. Uh, and the other is to do something. And once you get to the point of do something, then you can actually, you know, we could then say, okay, here are a couple of things that you can do. Because it is important if you want to bring about some change that there is some more buy-in and you don't leave this all to the people who are supposed to do it. <laughs> uh, because the people who are supposed to do it clearly are not able to do it, which is why this, it's creating the problem. And so these village report cards, I think, were very useful because it helped us realize that it, this, it's not just enough for some people to realize there's a problem and create some information that you can act on, but that you need to really spread out the ability to see the problem and then also think about how the problem could be solved. So this one leg inside and one leg outside the education system, I think, was important because often the outside asked many more questions that helped you to figure out how you can do things that could be potentially you know, brought uh, inside. 
so if I come back to Jahanabad, where I started my story, that's the district magistrate, and this is his crew. Uh, I said to him that uh, I think by this time, we were just a few years ahead of him, and I said that I think the problem that you faced one of the reasons could be what are we expecting children to do in the classroom? And I gave him a, you know, a briefer version of what I've told you. And I said, you know, but we are, I'm happy to talk. And you know, I, was, I was in Bihar already and I said that you know, maybe in a couple of days you know, we can come down and can have a chat. So I arrived literally two days later. I went to his office and he already had taken some of the thoughts and implemented. So he had gone, he had had with his team, they had been to about five schools and they had made their own little test, which was basically a grade level test and figured out that the kids were way below where they needed to be. So by the time I arrived, he had, I think, he had felt the problem. He had gone down a path of kind of trying to understand it. And, you know, when we reached his office, he was ready to act. He now needed to understand what to do. So his first reaction was to say, so you are Pratham, so why don't you bring your people and just train my teachers and you know, let's get rid of the problem. Now, 800 schools, every school may have at least three or four teachers. That's a substantial number of teachers. So I said, well, you know, that's not going to work. A, we don't have people like that. And B is, you've realized the problem. You want to solve it, but you are one person and you have you know, a whole lot of other people. So they need to... <laughs> Pull the scarf up. Okay. I'm going to just disrobe. <laughs> that will help, right? um, so we said, how about the same uh, process that you've gone through? Can we have some of your guys actually, because in the end you have a system, and the system has people at every layer. If you want to solve the problem, just the guy at the top feeling like you need to solve the problem is maybe necessary, but certainly not sufficient. So how do we work with... So he said, what do you need? And I said, I need a month, but I need two hours a day. I don't need the whole month. I need two hours a day from people who are one level up from the teachers. And so what we did was that uh, they took uh, two blocks. Uh, they had about five blocks. They took two blocks. And uh, the people at the block level who are above 20 schools are called cluster coordinators in the system, some of whom you can see here. So you, I wanted to put the picture so you can see what, who these people are. Uh, the, while they are in the education system, in a large part of India, especially in North India, they also run the elections. <laughs> they are the ones who do the electoral roles. They are the ones who... So they are very key pieces of our whole entire democratic structure. They do have a day job, which is to be in school and to help the school system. And so what we did essentially was to say that I need a couple of days, three or four days first with them to orient them about our way of thinking. Exactly. That's, that's who runs our country <laughs> at the ground level. Uh, even in southern states, at this level, above the level of the teacher, there are not that many women because you're, technically your job is to visit 20 schools, which means some amount of uh, running around. Um, two things in, I mean, going into slight detail because, because you know, how do you then influence, you know what to do, but how do you influence the system? Two things. Uh, the first day they came, uh, we said, okay, if I go into an average school in your district, how many children will I find there today? Can you give me a number? And they gave numbers. And the numbers were all around 60, 65, 70, 72, 75%. And then we said, if I go to an average school and I show you the little tool that I had, how many kids in third, fourth or fifth grade will be able to read the simple story? And they put down some numbers. Then we went out of the building to about 10 schools nearby, and this was not far from the district headquarters. So presumably those schools have some, uh, some advantages. And we came back and you had to put next to the number that you had put down what you actually saw. The attendance numbers were very close to the reality because they had been looking at it a lot. And so they had a very good sense of what attendance was like, exactly like their boss had. The learning numbers were way off. Everybody heavily overestimated what children would know. And these were people who were actually in the schools a lot. And so once they saw what that variation was, they were way more open to wanting to do something about it. And again, I think again and again we feel that unless you feel the problem, no day, at least in India, I think until you feel the problem, 
data doesn't change your mind. It's still your firsthand experience that there is really a problem. And then what we asked them to do was, you know, the, what we had learned to do and to do it for, um, uh, you know, 20 days or so, because we know that in 20 or 30 days, there's actually quite a big change if you do it. And once that layer was done, I remember going to a school at this time when uh, one of the ki well, one of the one of these guys was uh, teaching. You can see exactly what age they are. They've been teaching for a long time. They feel they know everything, and yet, when they were teaching, they discovered that a couple of things. One is that kids, you know, progressed really quickly. Uh, one of these men, I remember, it was a school where there was just rice fields all around, and he was the only guy who was, you know, uh, teaching. And he said to me, "I don't know what's going on." Usually kids go home after lunch. These kids are not going, they're still hanging around. I don't know, I mean, he kind of said it in a very, you know, disbelieving kind of way. So I said, I wonder what's going on. And we got up and I was joking and we looked out of the window and he came with me and he started looking outside. There was nothing outside. So I finally said, perhaps it's because of you. And he looked shocked because he had come through, I think, an entire professional life being blamed for many things but really rarely being able to take the credit for some big change that he was doing. So this whole process, I think, led us to many more learnings. One was that you have to feel the problem. You have to yourself feel that you can solve the problem. And once you've done that, then you're ready to be a missionary, except you're sometimes very nervous of talking to other people about it. So you need some more help in saying that I have done it and you can do it too. Because we are so used to listening to instructions and not communicating it in that way, at least in education. I think we do it very well in a lot of other fields. But in education, you are used to being following a curriculum, following a guide, following somebody else's instructions, that your, your own initiative and your own motivation somehow has been you know, lost in the whole case. So long, long story. Uh, this was what the Jahanabad story looked like, that in about uh, you know, over 200 schools that they did this in, Third, uh, standard three, four, and five, there was only 30% children who could actually read even the paragraph. And this is after spending, you know, if you think about five years of school and 200 days every day, that's a 1,000 days of being in school, this is what we were able to produce. And a large number, almost 60%, who were not able to read even words, which accounted for why you want to leave school after lunch and play cricket, because there everybody can perform and everybody has a role and nobody tells you you can't do it. Uh, and with the lead taken by the guys that you saw, this is the kind of improvement that uh, was possible. They, with some interruptions and so on, they did about 70 days. And in 70 days, even if you can't see the numbers, you can see how the red <laughs> reduced and the green uh, increased. Uh, I have a little film, which I don't know if we, we can see it, but I can send it to you. It's on the desktop. Just to see what, I mean, I, I think it's, it's a very short one. Let's see. Uh, it's called, yes, yes, yes. You need the sound though. You, you need to hear her reading. इस पे देखो क्या लिखा है ये ये हम ये ठीक क्या नाम है नैसी जोर से बताओ क्या नाम है नैसी काले काले बादल छा छाए हैं तेज बारिश हो रही है मोर भी भी नाच रही रहा है सब 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 मोर दे दे रहे हैं काले बादल छाए हैं तेज बारिश हो रही है 
So this is 40, 50 days and uh, I think that apart from the fact that she can read, we didn't fix the sound. I think it's the sound of her, I mean, she sits straighter, she talks louder and uh, the, this film didn't catch but there was a beautiful smile at the end of it. I think that apart from reading, I think a lot of these other things that happen are fundamental to giving the child the belief that, you know, they they can do uh, stuff. Um, I'm going to move quickly now because I know we have uh, we need to leave time for. Um, so very quickly, a couple of just stepping back and looking at it. So what is so different about all this? What is it doing that was not being uh, done before? And if I think about the core work that we started with, what happens between the learner and whoever is the instructor? I think there are a couple of quite different. Uh, uh, issues from what happens in a typical classroom. One is there's a clear goal. The goal is that I'm going to make sure that you have these, I'm going to help you acquire basic foundational skills which will then help you to move ahead both on your own as well as with others. If you can read and you can understand and if you have the confidence to say I didn't understand that actually takes you quite far because while we, I'm calling this a grade two level text most of these kids, once they get to that Nancy stage, can almost read most simple things. And if along with that they have the confidence to say, I didn't understand this, can you explain it? I think these are skills that go quite, quite far. In terms of how this is all organized, you are uh, grouped for this by level, not by your grade. And you are grouped by level only temporarily because you move quite quickly from one level to the next. So that by the end of it, there's very few kids left in any uh, lower group. So you can taste the progress. The progress is very quick. You're not slotted into what, you know, where you're supposed to be. You can move through that. A lot of the work happens in groups, very interactively. You help each other quite a bit. And I think that from the classroom level, if I go up to how this change came about, I think a lot of our traditional way of doing things have to be left behind. And so if you want a big change, particularly in something like this, I think you have to be willing to let go of a lot of the scaffolding that has actually organized our basic school system and be willing to take the jump and move, you know, and move further. Um, is there resistance to all of this? So I just pulled out some of the recent articles from the press and, you know, there are many more. Uh, and to me, it's very interesting as to who criticizes you and why. Uh, some criticisms come from the pedagogy establishment and that's been actually the old uh, criticisms that have happened uh, between the ASER as well as this approach that we are using. And more recently I see that there is criticisms coming from those who are, um, for example, BCG, not a traditional actor in, uh, in uh, education, <laughs> but now they're in, you know, working a lot. And I think that looking at criticisms, looking at the resistance, it's very interesting because it gives you a sense of where is this disruption actually affecting people. Uh, and again, these are just questions actually I have to people like yourselves who are probably, you know, have a bigger, uh, uh, you know, uh, analytical view of. 
So I think a lot of criticism comes from what is, what is the assumptions that you have that are being challenged. Uh, and what is your kind of theory of change of what do you think will bring about this reform? And uh, you know, I've tried to kind of bucket that into four or five major ones. One set of criticisms comes from the fact of, uh, from, from a point of view which says that unless you have all the inputs in place, you can't start talking about outcomes. So you need enough teachers, you need enough materials, you need enough you know, training, you need, you need sufficient and enough of a variety of inputs before you can say that I need to have outcomes like learning. And that often you know, is a strong point of view. Once the right to education law came into being, there's a whole set of people who believe that everything that law has to happen. And it's only after that that you can have conversations like these. Then there's a second group of people, I think, who believe that, uh, and I think that, that I, I don't disagree with any of these. There's a second group of people who believe that you know, teachers are not capable. And therefore, you need to have far longer training, better teachers, you know, all kinds of things to do with teaching. Because unless the people who are delivering this are for higher quality, you're not going to get the outcomes that you want. And therefore, that this is a long run process. You need to build institutions which are going to change this basic uh, you know, quality of teachers before you can go ahead. Then there is, I think, a third, which I would say is, a, to me, a techno managerial kind of approach which says that the, the reason you have poor outcomes is because the system doesn't function well. And for the system to function well, you need a lot of um, uh, you know, uh, push for good functioning. So biometrics for when you come into school, monitoring apps, we're going to make sure that you're doing the stuff that you're supposed to be doing, uh, maybe better teacher deployment systems, and so on. Often there's a technology solution to these. And once those are all in place and the system functions, then you'll see much better outcomes. So you know you have a poor system. Why is the system poor? Inputs are poor. The quality of whoever is in it is poor. The systems don't work well. And there's maybe a fourth one which says there's no incentives. That for us, any one of us to do things, we need proper incentives. We need accountability. And these structures are missing. You know, you become a teacher. You're a teacher for life, and uh, so on and so forth. And probably we fall into a fifth category, which says that there is a structural problem. And the structural problem is at the core of it is where the learning and the teaching happens. And the expectations around that are actually wrong. Um, are there economists in this audience? OK. So Land Pritchett, who many of you may know, uh, has a wonderful paper. And the reason I like the paper a lot is that the title tells everything. You don't even have to read the paper, because the title gives you. Uh, and more economists should write papers like that. And uh, the, the paper is called The Negative Consequences of Overambitious Curriculum. And I think that we are certainly an example of that. Because if you look at the situation, and we've done, we work a lot with state governments in different places. There was one particular study that was done uh, by JPAL, which is interesting. The whole year long, teachers worked with kids and using some of the methods that we are talking about, but still within the bounds of the curriculum. And then in the summer that year, we were able to persuade Bihar government to say that teachers will work with the kids, but we put the curriculum aside and we aim for the kinds of goals that we are talking about here. And the same teachers were able to produce far higher results in that one month in the summer holidays than in the whole school year. What was different? The teachers were the same. The children were the same. The difference was, I think, that the pressure of the curriculum had been uh, moved away. And so I think that a lot of, in understanding the resistance and the criticisms, it is really what is the theory of change and how willing are you to go down the logical you know, steps to take you from how you understand the problem to, uh, and to many of these uh, the critics, I often feel like it would be helpful to have a conversation to say, where do you see the beginning of the problem? You may not like my solution, and I think that's perfectly valid. But where do you see the beginning and where do you see the logical next few steps and how and where are you bringing about this change uh, that, that, that you think is uh, uh, this important. So just, just going a little bit further, you know, right now where we are, we see that this issue of learning is maybe thanks to Asar, which I didn't mention, that the, the, the tool that you saw is basically, uh, you know, is, has become 
the tool for measuring learning and uh, in in India, at least done by us. The report is called the Annual Status of Education Report. The thirteenth one came out this year, and it has played a big contribution in moving the discussion from just schooling to schooling and learning. Um, and so, you know, working with a lot of state governments, we can see that year on year, uh, state governments are moving towards wanting to make a big change. The challenge seems to be how do you sustain that momentum year on year on year so that it becomes part of the institutional uh, you know, uh, way in which schools function. How can you have this catch-up mechanism as part of the system rather than as an add-on that comes in as some kind of a reform effort? But I think where I'd like to leave off and where I think there are big questions and some young people asked me this last night as well, is that why is all of this not a bigger political agenda? Uh, and, you know, uh, while this is something that, you know, I mean, if you think about India's having 250 million children in school, and if you believe what I'm showing you and what the Asar report says, that at least half the kids are way behind where they ought to be, that is a huge number. That's a hundred and some million children, some of whom are in everyone's home. So why is it not a bigger agenda for, you know, at the bureaucratic level, at the policy level is one thing, but why is it not a bigger political agenda? And I have to say that I don't have answers for that. You see flashes of, you know, Nitish Kumar in his early days, Banish Sisodia currently. You see, you see, and these are, I, I think these are individual priorities that people have been able to surface. But it doesn't seem to seep into the parties that they belong to. And therefore, there is clearly something that going from the individual to a bigger uh, agenda to actually entering when these people become powerful, for it to stay on, it has to move beyond individual. And we can't see why that is the case. Uh, I, I, uh, I want to just leave you with a couple of questions. One is that, say, for example, I spent some time in uh, Himachal, and I know uh, uh, somebody here has, he may have some insights. Uh, in detailed discussions with very senior people in Himachal, uh, he, one of them said it very well. He said that every single legislative, uh, you know, elected uh, state person to the state legislature has visited his office. Every one of them has had an agenda for education, and the agenda tends to be teacher transfer. <laughs> and not a single person. He said, he explained to me, you are talking to me about learning outcomes and how important they are. You are saying it. Some of my teachers say it. But not a single elected official has ever raised with me the fact that he wants the schools in his constituency to have higher learning. So why should I act? Because it doesn't seem to be a... a and I, I frankly had no answer for it. And later on thinking about it, I think, you know, I wondered uh, two or three things. And I would love to have some discussion on that. You know, is education or health still in India seen as a private problem? to be solved by private and individual ways rather than by collective. Uh, I had a, 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 an incident again that reminds me of uh, you know, a way to answer this. This was a group of mothers in a, a village in Jaunpur district in UP. And I remember asking these moms, you know, uh, whose school is it? Ye kiska school hai? So they said, yes, sarkari school. Hai. This is a government school. So I said, who is government? And they started laughing. They're saying, you know, the district magistrate is government. The block official is government. So I said, uh, so where does the government get its money? And their point was, jo raj karta hai, uske paas paisa hota hai. Those who rule have money. So I tried to explain, uh, and I know I went back and I thought I should have taken much better public finance courses, because clearly I'm not making any. So I said, but uh, how, does, how do they get the money? And they said, they have money. Otherwise, they would not be ruling. So I tried to explain, uh, OK, when you uh, uh, buy a, a bus ticket, you know, part, they said we don't buy a bus ticket, we just go in the bus, okay? Uh, okay, uh, yeah. when you buy biscuits, like, we buy, you know, I mean, none of this seemed to work. So finally, at least this was, you could say that every cell phone that you have, you know, you're paying. I mean, it just seems so circuitous to say that you go to get your, you know, prepaid, whatever, charge, and that somehow goes into the coffers of the government seemed like very far away. So basically, a government ka school hai, and the government should come and see and make sure that things happen. For my own children, I don't expect anything from the school. If I had money, I would put them into a tuition class, and then he would make progress. This seemed to be the, the, the framework with which you were moving. 
So how do you make the fact that you know we are all paying money? I mean, everybody is paying money to make education happen, and yet you're not getting what you ought to. How does that become? And then add to that the fact that regardless, people often ask me, so how is this government versus the last government? And I feel they're quite similar, frankly, because they've all been obsessed with IIMs and IITs and things like this. And perhaps this is also an obsession that we have with excellence rather than at some level with equity that makes it to be this. So just to end uh, with really an open question, that I think that where we started our work, more or less we are still right there, is how does citizens and governments really come into this picture? And really for any big change to happen, perhaps it has to be a large number of citizens who really believe that it's time for change, and that is what will push uh, you know, the whatever we call the government to make a change. So I'll stop there, and I hope you'll help me answer some of these questions. People don't have questions, they're leaving. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Akesh Mohan. Yes. Uh, I have hundreds of questions, but I'll expand to a couple of um, questions. How, in looking at these four outcomes, all the reasons you think about this question, are they different from other poor countries? Do other poor countries, say, people in India don't like comparing with Sub Saharan Africa, but that's a real comparison. Are the learning outcomes similar there, and the teaching problems similar? Uh, so, and, and, and leave the others. I think this okay. Is, because you know, in a lot of the um, JPAL and other observations, we've been told for ten years, teachers don't go to school, doctors don't go to clinics, nurses, etc. Is the experience similar in other poor countries? Are we special? So I would say that a big question is measurement, yes. right? And the process that we went through to say. You know, in some countries, like in Kenya, you have a primary school leaving exam. So that's uh, a place where you can see, perhaps, you know, what the outcomes are. Uh, in India, we don't have it till the 10th. So therefore, you know, a lot of, you may leave school by then. You may have very good 10th grade results because everybody who could have uh, potentially got till there are leaving. So the other type of measurement which starts quite, you know, we basically use this simple measurement from first grade onwards. And people criticize us saying that such an easy test, why are you giving it to kids in eighth grade? But there are still 30, 25, 30% kids there who can't do it. So the other kind of measurement has, is used now in quite a few countries in Africa. And the answer to your question varies. So Kenya is kind of a little bit better than us. Uh, it's used in Pakistan. Pakistan is exactly like us. <laughs> it, it variations, of course, across in different parts of, Africa, uh, of uh, Pakistan. Francophone Africa is a lot worse. And for example, if you say that in India we have 50% kids at fifth grade who can't read, uh, or who can read, whichever way, in Mali that number is 10%. And so I think that part of the Francophone results being really bad is French. Because at least here we are being assessed in our own local language, whereas there it's, uh, you know, the medium of instruction is French. Uh, this kind of measurement, which is done in this very simple way, is actually, you know, raising this kind of question in Africa as well. And uh, I think globally, the fact that if you wait and if you do grade level measurements, you may be missing out on a huge big issue early on, is at least now being talked, you know, talked about. I think their problems are also quite. I mean, they have somewhat different problems. For example, schools are sometimes very large. Nigeria. Uh, there was some of my colleagues who went to a school which have 2,000 children in a primary school. And so that has, you know, several other problems. So fewer schools, but much larger schools. And so the, you know, what do you do there? But I think that this absenteeism problem, I actually don't buy it. Because uh, one is, what is the reason for absenteeism? And if you look at, even if you look at studies in India, if every teacher takes all the leave that they're entitled to, which why should they not? Because they're entitled to it. Uh, you would get a 25% rate like you have now. So either you have to change the conditions under which you can take leave and then blame it. And it's very easy to blame teachers. Everybody does it. And I personally feel that we have enough evidence to show that given realistic goals and given adequate support, teachers can actually do a really good job. If you give them a really idiotic goal and give them no support, 
or I wouldn't go to school either, <laughs> you know, frankly. So if you really feel like we have to work with teachers, then you have to really work with them. You know, you have to have these kind of cluster guys visit your schools all the time. Punjab is implementing, we are with them in implementing a basic learning improvement. And the unions are up in arms because somebody is visiting your school every second day. So the good schools really like it and the bad, I mean, the, the hardworking teachers love it and the less hardworking teachers don't like it. Uh, presumably less hardworking teachers have more time to be in the union or have more direct connections or seem to be able to have political action much faster than the hardworking uh, ones. So I think there are, I'm sure there are differences, but I think some of the common problems and the land issue I think is common everywhere. I think it's only in Western countries which have had school, universal schooling for much longer that the curriculum expectations, the capabilities to deliver it, the understanding of what is to be done is much closer to each other than there is in countries which have high aspirations but low capability to deliver it. I mean, Vietnam apparently is a great example where they have really done the primary education quite well where they have really, I think there was an equity uh, push probably, you know, uh, in the last 20 years, which has ensured that at least basic education is strong. If your basic foundational education is good, you can go quite far. So I think paying attention to that early on, you know, uh, has perhaps worked there. I, I don't know enough about, you know, inner workings of those countries to uh, say enough. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to take you back to uh, Jahanabad where you were talking with the district magistrate. And he said, I did this, I did that, it didn't seem to work. And I imagine the first thing he did was uh, was uh, press on the teachers about attendance. Yeah. And, and increasing the attendance level. Yeah. Now, somewhere about maybe 10 years ago, the World Bank did a study of teacher attendance in India. And Bihar was uh, at the bottom of this list, you might say, as usual. Um, and what, what I'm wondering, and the question I want to ask, is uh, just teacher attendance alone, if we can get that up to par or up, up to a higher standard, just by itself, I would think that would uh, make a significant improvement. Uh, what's been your experience with that? I think that's not enough. I think obviously well, you I need to have, really, yes. But, uh, but as a first step, uh, so, how much difference does it make? So I would say that if I look at a traditional, typical classroom in India, well, you know, what does a fifth grade teacher do? And what is a fifth grade teacher expected to do? They are expected to take the fifth grade textbook and start from chapter one and go up to chapter 24 and finish that in 12 months. That is what a teacher is expected to do. A fifth grade classroom, if you saw the Jahanabad numbers, probably has 10 or 15 percent kids who are getting what you're saying. So I think a regular teacher attendance would benefit that 15% tremendously and really not make much of a difference to the others unless the teacher was given a different goal to do. And I think from Bihar, numbers you can see, I mean, from the, I mean we, we've done quite a lot of work in Bihar. I think that given realistic goals and support, uh, for, firstly, teacher attendance will be higher if you stop doing certain things, such as having trainings during the school year Bihar continues to do that. Madhya Pradesh, for example, does most of its trainings in the holidays. So that during school time, teachers are in school and not away in training. Secondly, if you stop deploying teachers for other work, uh, such as census, such as, I mean, the, the, uh, the, the right to education law says you can take teachers away for disaster, for elections, and for census. Now, for example, Bihar at one stage had two state elections in the same year. Well, you may as well shut the schools down and let everybody play cricket. Maybe we'll have some, you know, more World Cup players and not bother, you know, with the... So I think there is a lot to be done and it's a mystery to me why teachers' unions don't agitate for some of these things. And that may be because you get paid extra to do census. You get other patronage benefits from handling elections locally and so on. But I do think that the same teachers with support can do a lot. And, you know, to be stingy about support means that you really don't want the teachers to work. <laughs> yeah. I don't have a question, just a comment. Yes. I'm Manjula Shah, and I was in India until yesterday. Okay. Just got back. And I had the good fortune of visiting uh, four schools, primary, government primary schools, and uh, 
two of them I went with some people from Pratham. Oh, okay. And I have to say, I was thoroughly impressed because things were, I saw the children sitting on the floor and they were using consonants and making words. There were groups of children uh, drawing with chalk on the floor and I really felt that not having tables and chairs was, was really an advantage and uh, schools should not try to concentrate on providing furniture. <laughs> um, I thought that the curriculum in terms of what was on the board and what each of the kids had uh, really was uh, geared towards giving them the a kind of sense of accomplishment. And I also saw groups of children who had graduated from that and were sitting in a different group because these were kids who could read sentences. They were writing yeah. essays and they were doing things together. So there was a lot of emphasis on group work um, of children helping each, each other. other. And uh, uh, the classroom, the teachers looked really enthusiastic. And I think that they also sensed that they were making an impact on the children. And I think that sort of you know, gave them encouragement to proceed further. So I have to say that uh, the curriculum particularly is what struck me as something that helped the kids get a sense of confidence that they could master things and move ahead. So I just want to congratulate Pratham for the, for, for the work that you are doing. And I must say that I'm a total devotee of, <laughs> of the work no, that this, has been done. This is really and nice to you. This was in UP. Yes. And I, okay. Was, Where, which district did you go to? Uh, this was in Muradabad. Okay. And it was in the Kashiram colony. Okay. Which is the people, children who are at the very bottom end of it. But they were all wearing uniforms. They all mm -hmm. looked like my children or someone else's kids. And uh, they were quite busy doing what they were doing, not paying that much attention to who else was coming and going. So, so this, this uh, what she's talking about is actually a massive upscaling of what I talked about in Jahanabad. The entire state of UP is trying to do this. And there was huge skepticism, led by me, that UP would ever be able to actually. And yet, same teachers, the much maligned teachers, are actually uh, partly because the layer above them actually did all of this stuff themselves and were able to, I think, guide them. I mean, we have to still wait and see. There's another month left of how far they can reach by the 30th of April. But so far, it has been actually quite remarkable that a very, um, what should I say, sluggish system like UP that has had nothing on quality education for 10, 15 years is able to rise and without much, uh, what shall I say, mm, um, it's not a high priority for the chief minister. Uh, <laughs> I asked one of the district magistrates there, uh, you know, he, the, he's just been transferred after the elections have been announced. He was the district magistrate of Raibareli. And so we were visiting in the, in the district and somebody said, you know, uh, DM Saab is very interested in education. So I went to meet him. So I said, why are you so interested? And he said, well, everybody has a personal interest. And I actually think that this primary education stuff is good. So I asked him, what do we have to do to have 75 guys like you be interested? And he pointed to the photograph behind him and he said, well, he'll have to say that. So I said, is he not saying it? And he said, no. <laughs> but despite all that, that's why it's not necessary that the very top, but you know, a whole, I mean, UP is, if UP changes, I mean, the world will change, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, I'm a second year MBA student here at Yale and uh, I just wanted to ask you to mention that Vinayu Manish Sisodia has been doing some good work in Delhi and Rajasthan government also was focusing a lot in Vasundha Raja's time on primary education. Uh, what's your view on these programs and where do you think these programs currently lack and the good things that they are doing? And the second question that I have is, it sounds like when you talk about the layer above teachers uh, or you talk about people going and inspecting these schools, uh, it sounds like accountability is a big part of transformation. So, going to ask if Pratham is doing anything to improve accountability in any of the schools that you're working with. I mean, I think that to me, uh, a really, see, the, like the theories of change that I described, I think all of those are needed. It's not like you can do, you know, why should you not have enough teachers? Why should the system not function? There ought to be accountability. There ought to be, you know, longer run, deeper capability building of teachers. All of those are important. 
But I think that what she said is very key. You need to feel progress. You need to feel that you're making a difference. And I think the only way to feel that in a school system is for children to progress. You can do a lot of systemic reform, but it doesn't hit the kids. So you can have, for example, much better procurement systems. You know, it probably saves the taxpayer, you know, good money, but it doesn't get to the, to me, the core is what happens in the classroom between the teacher and the kids. Because if I go back to my first thing about the discouraged teacher and the disappointed parent and the disinterested child, I think that whatever you do has to hit that first. Once that changes, which is what she's describing, then many things become possible. And you can ride the wave of, you know, uh, whatever, progress or gain to do many more things. So I think that, you know, uh, if I compare what happened in Rajasthan in the last couple of years, I think they tried many things, but a lot of them were management type things. Again, I'm not saying they're not important, but I don't think they filtered into the classroom. So you had you consolidated schools. I think that's a, that was needed. But in consolidating schools, if you had been able to link it so people would feel that because the schools were consolidated, my child is doing better, and it's visible to everybody in the village, and the, everybody in the village is actually not educated, but I can still feel it, I think that that reform would have gone further. What I think Sisodia is doing is that, number one, they've paid a lot of attention to parents. And a mistake that a lot of education reform movements do is that they feel you can fix the system. You know, I hear a lot of talk uh, in uh, the jargon these days about systems reform. I mean, system may be the admi, na? So, you know, wo reform or ki nahi, wo to dekhni zarurat hai. And usme admi, aurat, whatever. I mean, parents, if, you, if parents don't feel there is something happening to the kids, and I think attendance is actually a very good proxy because why are the kids going off and playing cricket? Like, what the hell are you doing in school? It's really boring. I mean, you know, why are you all sitting here? You know, presumably there's going to be a good dinner, but other than that, <laughs> there has to be, you know, you, you've got to feel that you're part of this whole picture. So system reforms, I think, are really needed, but they often don't focus on the real, uh, you know, matter. And so, uh, you know, Sisodia has paid a lot of attention to parents. Uh, he also, they've done, I mean, I think they're, they're handling the core, but they're also handling ex exactly the three pieces that I think. They're handling teachers. They're handling parents, and they're handling you know, what needs to happen between teachers and children. And they've had a lot of resistance, exactly the same kind of resistance. Partly, you know, we feel the same way. And when you're getting attacked both from the right and the left, you know you're doing something right. You know? yeah. <laughs> I need a moderator here. OK, we'll go to the back of the class, because everybody addresses the front of the class. <laughs> My name is Ram. I'm a doctoral student in the Anthropology program. Um, it's a privilege to hear you speak. That was obviously a landmark institution. Yes, our report, galvanized change in. Not according to the people who I showed you. Yeah, actually, actually, with respect to that, also, I have, I have a skeptical question, but I also have a less skeptical question. The skeptical question is around since as, uh, Pratham as an organization carries out both measurement, but also learning initiatives, uh, interventions in various kinds. So the question that a third party observer might ask is the same party is carrying out interventions to, to make progress, but also measuring that progress. Is that not uh, a design flaw in some respect? And is that one reason why one sees different results with the All India Survey in Education and Assembly? That's the skeptical question. On the less skeptical question, um, I had the opportunity of learning more about the Teaching at the Right Level program that your Himachal team was doing, uh, which was fantastic. And generally, I think one of the things that works uh, so well for Pratham is its integration with state level uh, teams, generally work through the government. And not, for example, like Teach for India, which works outside the government system, which I think even the government doesn't make this kind of work. The question that I want to ask you with respect to TARL is, could you share just the genesis of this uh, and, and the implementation of this? Because the, the challenge, of course, for many teachers in the community is that many children in the same classroom are at different levels. So teaching them with limited manpower, limited School becomes hard. So, what are the kinds of pedagogical tools that are used? And the story you actually, uh, as an organization, went through to arrive at this solution. So, the skeptical one, I think we should answer first. So, yes, we have been doing. So, Asar has been a, I would say, a uh, now a, a part of the landscape for you know over ten years. And every five years, we have a big discussion about whether it should stop. The first five years, uh, there was a very strong feeling. And you know, Asar is carried out by a different organization in every single district in India. So the design is done 
by Pratham, but the implementation is done by local groups. And there is a quite a lot of, uh, you know, uh, quality checks uh, on. A big problem was when the teacher training colleges, the diets they are called in India, the government teacher training colleges wanted to participate because it does that compromise the citizen aspect of ASAR. And uh, after a lot of discussion within, we decided that uh, if an organization wants to do it, as long as they implement it well, why should they not come forward? Uh, last ASAR, 260 diets, half the diets of India did ASAR, sometimes full states. And these are the trainees are going to be teachers. And the way that some of the principals explain it is that the institution does a lot for what you're supposed to do inside the school, you know, prepare teachers for that, but never teach them to engage with communities or parents. And ASAR provides uh, that. So one is who does it. The who is many thousands of, I mean, there are 500 different partners who do it every year. The second is that, yes, we do learning uh, programs. Uh, should we, which one should we stop doing? <laughs> And I think that uh, stopping, uh, we are now doing ASAR every other year, partly because, you know, you have to raise a lot of money also for, I mean, it's compared to other surveys, actually, it's not that expensive, but you still have to raise about, you know, uh, a certain amount of money. And, you know, just a year's gap seems to be fine. You know, you, if you would leave three years, then there may be a big change. Um, so should we stop doing the learning initiatives? But that seems, what would be ideal is if, I think if uh, the measurement of literacy in the census could actually be a real measurement and not uh, if the NSS would take on the role. We need to pass this on to someone who's not us. We are not able to find that someone yet. <laughs> and I think that state by state there could be, but it requires a lot of persistence to want to do us a year after year. I mean, it's like the largest survey that's done in, I don't know, in India for sure, probably globally as well. Uh, the real question, which you didn't ask, is that there is skeptics who say that if the Pratham works with the state, the results will be good. These skeptics clearly don't look at evidence. We work with many states for many years, <laughs> and there are many states that are not doing well where we work, and there are several states where we don't work who are doing well. So the counterfactual is you know, quite, quite, quite strong. On the teaching at the right level, I tried to give a little flavor of it. I mean, fundamentally, how do you deal with the fact that a lot of kids are behind? And you want to bring them up quickly. And you want to do it as part of the system. So one is, what are the instructional activities to do? Which, you know, I could go into, but you know, there are four or five quite simple things, some of which she described. Uh, and the other is the measurement part. Because during, whether when the government is implementing it, even in a massive state like UP, even in a period of three months, the baseline, which is exactly that tool, is helpful in grouping kids. So you, and, and it's not just the grouping, it's that the teacher now knows every kid in the class and knows what they can do. So that information is not captured in the data. That information is in her instructional mind to be able to use as to who will be in what group and what they will do. And the second is that you need to, you know, when there is a clear goal, I think the movement towards the goal, people actually really like the measurement because it makes you feel that you've come some way and it's been only a month but you actually made progress because you're used to a system where a whole year goes by and you may not have made much progress. So I think the measurement is, is an important one. The measurement is very simple but so it, 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 it plays a part in that. And then I think that if you think about what kids need to get ready for and you're going to exist in that system, I'm not saying that beyond this first round of building foundational skills we have some great ideas of what to do next. You want to create the habit among kids of working with each other because that help will come from each other then. You want to give the kids, I mean, you hit upon, I don't know if you're an education person, but you hit upon some very key. You want to give kids the motivation to want to go ahead. I think you learn when you're motivated. You want, and the motivation often comes from progress. So I think there's a lot of you know, basic psychology here at work, that if you get to give people, teachers or parents or children, the feeling that you're moving ahead, the chances that you'll move ahead is way higher. If you give people the expectation that everybody can learn, our systems don't do that. Our system says some people will come first, others will come last. But if you give the, and that's where I think the equity idea comes. If you feel like you are, your, your bedrock is that you can do it, and then people actually do, I think there's now a lot of research which shows that if you expect high, people do high. 
if you expect low, then you know you may as well play cricket. I mean, I mean, I'm all for cricket, by the way. You know, I'm using it in a bad way, uh, and I think that, and it has to be a methodology that everybody can use. It's not so you know highfalutin that only some people with lots of training can do it. What you saw was UP teachers doing it. Yes. Village volunteers can do it. I mean, your grandma can do it. If you know, it's it, it's not such a big thing, and. The other advantage is that while, say, for some things in health, you really do need inputs and you need expertise. I mean, every village in India has some people who are educated. So if you give, if we gave, you know, 30 days of our time for a year or two, I think India could be a different place. And I certainly feel even the skeptics have to accept that, you know, if you have something that you're rolling with, you know, what are you waiting for? <laughs> Here, come and moderate. Then you you know who's there. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, so uh, you lost one of your hands. Uh, yes, uh, your person is there. Yeah. Please introduce yourself. Yeah. Uh, hello, ma'am. Uh, I'm Sakshi Helen. I'm a master's student in the International Development Economics Program at the Graduate School. And my question is regarding uh, the parliament recently uh, passing an amendment in the RT uh, legislation scrapping the no detention policy. What is your view on that, like the consequences of that? Because that's based on like the traditional class and like examination system. So what is your view on that? How does it affect what does So it my view on that is that if it's a law, and you know, let's presume, I mean, you know, we don't listen to many laws, but if it's a law, we should take it seriously. Then it's a law now. So whatever we felt before it became a law, we should have done not to make it a law, but now it's a law. So how do you operate within the confines of the law to have you know, uh, and uh, the, I, and I think it's still an open case. It's a law, but if you go state by state and ask exactly how you're interpreting it, people are waiting, and therefore this is a very important moment because if you can come up with some good ideas at this stage and get people to implement some of those, so fifth and eighth to have an exam. Okay, what exam? How exam? Who will do the exam? That's all still quite open. Detain. Okay, when will you detain? Will you detain instantly? Will you detain after three months? When will you have the exam? And I, we, again, Himachal, it so happened that uh, uh, the Asar report was going to be released by the Himachal chief minister. And chief ministers like to re re release a report when the report does well. And when the report doesn't do well, they say, oh, Asar to bilkul bekar hai. Okay. <laughs> but you know, we are very open about it, you know, so that's fine. Uh, and uh, the report was supposed to be released uh, in the morning. But Pulwama happened two days before. So the chief minister went to the funeral of, there was one, one uh, soldier from. Uh, so as a result, we had like three hours in one room with everybody from the education department and the minister. So we had a lot of discussions. So I asked them this question, what are you going to do? And they said, what do you think we should do? So I said, if that mattered, I'll write a whole thesis and give you, but tell me what you're planning. And essentially, it boiled down to all these are still variables. When is the exam? What is the exam? Are you going to give one chance, two chances, two chances when? And my point to them was, so you, these, these kids had a problem. I mean, the kid is eight, 10 years old. So clearly the kid couldn't have a problem. The problem that has been imposed on the kid has been done by you guys. Do you accept it? They were like, well, you know, yes, okay. So then you have to do something before you can detain them. So can we come up with something between the first exam and the second exam that actually gives you a chance. And if after all of that, and if the kid comes, then would it be fair? So if the kid fails twice, is there something more that needs to be done with the kid? Is there some kind of a, so I feel like there is a, I think anybody working in education in India today who, I mean, I personally don't think detention, I mean, yes, you can detain, my point before it became a law would be, I'm all for detention, but not of the kid. So you can start with the education minister and detain everybody else. And that might actually help. I mean, I don't say that in public. But, but, but now that it is a law, how can you play with the framework to maximize the opportunity for the child to get help? And maybe this will make the children get a big remedial or whatever catch-up dose that was not available otherwise. So I think it's a very exciting space. And you know, people should play with this space so that is something concrete and useful comes out of it and not just just you know put all the kids 
you know, in jail or whatever they want to do. You know. so, so I saw four hands. Maybe we can get all the questions on the table and yeah, then okay. we can yeah. decide what okay. she wants to answer or not. So uh, there were two Sahaj and the gentleman with hands. So do you want to start? Okay. Um, so I had an opportunity to see a lot of what you were obviously first hand. And I was wondering if, the, so a lot of NGOs get this criticism that they make a parallel system and they don't work within the system. And Pratham has kind of done the exact opposite. He worked with like everybody right from like the teachers right to the top. And you think Pratham's work is kind of hindering the state governments from taking more responsibility for creating this innovation because they just think that will come and run these spending camps and ensure our children are literate. And that's where we don't need to do anything? Or do you think you're actually providing like that catalytic change for us, spark in them to be like, no, we should also do something now that Pratham has come in and said how terribly we're doing? So I'm just not letting Yeah, 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 okay. Perhaps why DCG is upset that Pratham is everywhere. Uh, yes. So. Yeah. So I worked at, my name is Diti. I worked at Jibal. My God, is there anybody here who hasn't worked in Pratham? <laughs> <laughs> the rest are all welcome. <laughs> okay. So I was working in teaching at the right level and the scale up that is happening in Karnataka. Karnataka, yeah. So the, the intervention of the report card and that, and they wanted to see whether the teachers would care more if they received the report card or not. Well, that's study never goes off the ground. Yeah, effect. so that's my question. That you know, when, when that happened, I was extremely disappointed because I thought that there would be a better outcome if the teachers were more involved in data and it didn't uh, take off. And I was just wondering if, like, with governments changing and transfers and these sort of things that keep happening, how, how does one keep the energy to keep hinging on change and progress and sort of see that through in the long run? Um, um, I'm not a member of Pratham, I'm a member of ASHA for education. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, you know, our experience is slightly different. We value Pratham very much. We love your material, your reports, they're excellent. Um, I experience a slightly different, you know, visit villages, and the smaller villages would might have a school, a single room school with one teacher for grades one to three. And the teacher may or may not be there on a given day. Um, the larger villages may have mm -hmm. up to grade five or grade eight. So there are large parts of you know, the education system that's missing. Or you visit certain areas and they'll tell you, no one in this district has passed science yes. at SSC. Yeah. Yeah. So we just don't enter those subjects. We never take those. I'm just wondering, what do you think the scale of the problem is? If we think, you know, we need education for SSC or HSC for all children in India, universal quality education, what's the scale of this problem? You know, mm -hmm. how big is it and how close are we? And uh, Sahaj has the last question. Yeah, so as you mentioned, uh, Pratham really tries very hard to work with the system and work with government at a number of levels. I was wondering if you could speak to sort of the level of institutional support, the sincere institutional support you get from a lot of governments. So Okay. Yeah. So one is that I think uh, to your first question, uh, the the government work is far larger uh, and has problems, like she's saying, and it goes up and down. There is instability, but I think uh, y it is also important to have some laboratories of your own, uh, where you can continuously keep refining, changing you know, coming up with better, newer things. And so we have, let's say, you know, given the diversity of India and the size, you need to have a substantial laboratory if you want to stay alive with, you know, what is the problem, what's the next problem, and, you know, keep a kind of an R&D going. So we have that, and the learning camps are part of that. But if you look at where our uh, uh, bulk of our, uh, I mean, our currently our teams are divided half and half. Uh, because uh, when we do it ourselves, each person has five villages. And they will do whatever they need to do for five villages, including trying to figure out which is the next piece that needs to be handled. And more or less where we are headed right now is to say step back. If you are able to do early childhood well, the first one or two years in school, and carry parents along, can that then sustain higher? Because part of it is parents can't help, uh, or parents can't identify. And therefore, if you do the right, I mean, if you do foundations well, so we are working now, again, in the early childhood space, partly ourselves, but largely with the ICDS system. Because there you see that although there is health and nutrition, the preschool education gets really left behind. So how do you, you know, 
How do you also bring in some volunteer? Because it's easier at some level to help at that stage. Um, and then with the governments, I think that, uh, you know, you have to, the, the problem with the government work is not working with the government. The problem with the government work is us having the support to be able to field teams for a long time to work with the government. The sources of support are important. I mean, that's partly why I'm in America. I, I've come here to do this talk, but I'm also here to, I mean, not here, but in the US to raise funds. Uh, three sources of support that we have. One is corporate, uh, you know, Indian corporates who now with the CSR law have to give money. Second is uh, uh, foundations, usually international foundations, whose interest is now moving largely to sub-Saharan Africa because, you know, we are putting, I don't know, we are shooting down satellites, we are going to the, you know, space and all this. So, you know, why can't we, clearly India has money. We are having fancy weddings, you know. So, you know, people, people don't want to fund in India anymore. Um, and the third is, uh, for, for us, is, uh, you know, individuals. Individuals, usually Indian diaspora. Now, of these three types of funds, funding our direct work, corporates love to do, especially if it's close to their factories or their areas of interest. And those tend to be only in certain parts of India, Karnataka, Pune. Everybody wants to fund in Pune. Well, Pune doesn't need any more help. They're doing quite fine. <laughs> Uh, you know, Maharashtra, Gurgaon, you know, Coimbatore. But nobody wants to go to like Jharkhand, large parts of Assam, I mean, rest of the country, Himachal, which is a very, people don't, I mean, it's, there's no corporate interest there because it's the, it's the so uh, individuals, you know, who live here don't have great, I mean, don't have great faith in the government functioning. They may have great faith in certain political parties, but not in the functioning of the government for obvious reasons. So the real challenge for us is to maintain and be able to ride. I mean, the Karnataka case that she's talking about, when the opportunity came, we had actually, we had to pull people from other places to be able to work with the government. And for the first two years, it was a textbook case of how you can really, you know, so JPAL was going to evaluate it and then they had elections and then, you know, everything got delayed. And also to carry out a JPAL type research study, you can't just up and do it. You have to have a certain process which we miss the boat essentially. Uh, and so, you know, you have to have enough kind of uh, uh, resources to be able to, now for me, for example, I feel like, you know, I don't know how many more years I have uh, left in Pratham, but it's really the scaling or the spreading which is the exciting thing. Our strategy right now is a big community involvement because that will be slower, but it will be deeper to get local people to participate and then the working with the government. And again, you know, if you work with 10 governments, just by the law of averages, some will be doing fine and some will not. And so you can, you know, keep yourself energized, like UP right now is the one. Everybody's attention is on UP. And like, as soon as the phases of the elections hit, let's see what it does. <laughs> so I wish they could just delay the UP elections till after April 30th, because the schools will shut then. You know, I want to pass a law which says, please do elections in the summer holidays. Because it really screws up the schools, you know. You know, democracy is a real, you know, problem for 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 <laughs> at least the elections are. Um, I, and I, so I think that's the real game. And the, uh, traditionally, it's only the foundations who have who are able to take the risk that we will fund people, they will work with the government, and maybe nothing will come of it. Uh, and they have, you know, been in the game long enough to know that this is a long run game. But corporates and individuals have shorter run vision, so. That's the, I think. Rupini, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.